Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for a conversation with authors Dr. Jim Smotherist and Dr. Regina Bradley. My name is Talia. I'm the events manager here at Flyleaf Books. If you're new to Flyleaf, I encourage you to browse our full events calendar by clicking the Flyleaf Books logo at the top of your screen. I've been adding listings for the summer and fall seasons, and there are new things going up all the time. So please subscribe to us on Crowdcast so you don't miss anything. If you'd like to support Flyleaf and our guests, please keep in mind that copies of both of these authors' titles are available from Flyleaf. We are open for browsing, so you can come in and shop in person or click the link below our faces to buy your books. If you've already bought your copy but would like to support the store, there is a little donate button below our faces, and you can send us just a couple dollars, um, and that does help us continue to offer programming for y'all, so we really appreciate anything that you're able to donate. All right, let me go ahead and introduce our authors. Dr. Jim Smothers is Professor of Afro-American Studies at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and author of The Black Arts Movement, Literary Nationalism in the 1960s and 1970s, along with Behold the Land, The Black Arts Movement in the South, which just came out from UNC Press. And Dr. Regina N. Bradley is an alumna Nasir Jones Hip Hop Fellow, Assistant Professor of English and African Diaspora Studies at Kennesaw State University and co-host of the critically acclaimed Southern Hip Hop podcast, Bottom of the Map, with music journalist Christina Lee. Dr. Bradley is one of the foremost authorities on contemporary Black culture in the American South and is the author of Chronicling Stanconia, The Rise of the Hip Hop South, which explores how hip hop duo Outkast influences the culture of the Black American South in the long shadow of the civil rights movement. Thank you both so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. Yes, thank you, thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and turn off my camera and microphone to give you the floor. If anyone watching wants to submit questions, feel free to do that in the chat or in the ask a question feature at the bottom of your screen and I'll pop back up at the end of the event to read out the questions. All right, so Dr. Smothers, do you wanna just kick us off with uh, a little bit about your book? Sure, sure. Okay, so you could say that this book uh, has, as the saying goes, a long foreground. Uh, basically, uh, I got into it uh, because um, some years ago, as you, you heard, uh, I wrote a sort of more general history of the origins and early days of the Black Arts Movement. And I, among other things, uh, covered the Black Arts, you know, talked a little bit about the black arts movement in the South. And the, by the black arts movement, I mean the uh, sort of explosion of black cultural, uh, visual art, literary, uh, theater, music, dance, and so forth that exploded uh, in the 1960s and 1970s that was joined at the hip with the black power movement. In fact, I really, you know, I make a distinction between black arts and black power by name sometimes because uh, we're just used to doing it. But in fact, I don't really see any distinction really between black arts and black power. Some people sometimes say that black arts is the cultural wing of the black power movement. But I could think you could just as easily say that the Black Power Movement is the political wing of the Black Arts Movement. In other words, they really, you, it's a fool's errand to try to separate the two. And the thing about Black Arts people, I mean, Black Power people um, coming uh, really in after Malcolm X, among other folks, is that there are people who believe in Black Power that culture is a necessary arena of political transformation. You can't transform people's consciousness unless you transform the culture. And you can't transform the politics of the country unless you transform the consciousness. You know, it's all tied up. So we're talking about art, we're talking about culture. So anyway, um, you know, the more I got into the South, which had been a part of the Black Arts Movement, I wrote the first book, there hadn't really been that much written about the black arts movement as a whole, but um, this black arts movement in the South was really just completely, you know, largely unknown 
to most people, I think, who, you know, who didn't live there or during the time or who didn't participate. You know, generally speaking, the black arts movement was associated with New York, Chicago, Detroit, San Francisco, Los, Los Angeles, um, Philadelphia, and so forth. You know, not much reference to the South. But as I got into it, I, I came to the conclusion that actually the most vibrant and the most influential, uh, from my perspective, iteration of the black arts movement actually happened in the South, that there was no place in the country where it got embedded in the grassroots to the degree that it um, did in the South, especially in certain cities like Atlanta and New Orleans, but, and, and, but also, uh, also North Carolina, um, Texas, Tennessee, and so forth. Um, and uh, also, you know, I, it got me into the, thinking about the question is what, when does uh, the, you know, what you might think of as the center of gravity of black art in the United States get moved from say places like New York or Los Angeles or Chicago significantly to the South. You know, how, and even art generally, how does Atlanta become a world-class art city? How does Houston become a, a sort of a world-class or important cultural center, Miami? Um, in terms of black art, why is the National Black Theater Festival in North Carolina? Why is there the Black Arts Festival in, Atlanta, which draws, I don't know, Regina, you live there. How many people go to it? Half a million people, 600, oh, yeah. it's, it's basically, you know, for those of you who think in terms of, uh, I'm old, but you know, so it's, it's, you know, basically Woodstock every year and has been doing it for years, black Woodstock. You know, I mean, in other words, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people not all black people, not simply solely black people, but largely black people. And uh, how does this happen? You know, why you don't have that in New York, really. You don't have that in Chicago. You don't have that in Los Angeles. There's really nothing quite like it, or Philly, or, or you know, pick a city up, up north, including the cities that we think of as the sort of culture center. Mm. So my argument in the book is that it's the black arts movement and the embedded that actually begins to transform the center of gravity of black art in the United States uh, from the usual suspects, art suspects like New York or Chicago to uh, two places in the South. And uh, so, you know, it's a really fundamental transformation, really, you know, talking about what, you know, Regina Bradley's book, you know, Stanconia is kind of thinking about, because she, and because one of the things that if you think about black culture is, yeah, sure, the, the South was always the center of R&B and soul music, right? Always the center of popular music. I mean, yeah, Chicago and so forth. But you know, you still had the recording studios, a lot of them, and the musicians and so forth. I mean, James Brown never really lived anyplace else, but the South, far as I know. Uh, but um, but you know, he didn't have much relationship to say the contemporary theater. He didn't have much relationship to visual arts. You didn't have the situation where you could think of, which you know, I think you really take up to some degree in Stanconi, of how this all of a sudden becomes embedded with black art generally. You know, where you have hip hop. You know, I mean, it's old now, but you know, P. Diddy acting in a raisin in the sun, right? You have hip hop artists or hip hop related artists um, starting putting on plays and starting mm -hmm. film studios in Atlanta or getting, you know, all kinds of ways. So, I mean, it's the kind of thing that Otis Redding or James James Brown or Carla Thomas or Rufus Thomas, they didn't do that stuff. I'm not saying they might not have been somewhat interested in it, but that's just not what they did. That's not, that wasn't, there was no infrastructure for them. 
So, you know, that's kind of what I am was doing in the book is thinking about how that happened and talking about, um, you know, how it happened in different places. And the thing about the movement, that's the last thing I'll say, and then I'll just, you know, Regina, you can jump in, is the thing that makes it hard, as, as Regina knows, to talk about these sorts of grassroots things when you're talking regionally or nationally is... Uh, Places are different, you know. New Orleans is not uh, is not uh, Durham, is not Greensboro, which is not Atlanta, which is not Birmingham, which is not Houston, which is not Gal even Galveston, which is you know not a very far drive, mm -hmm. uh, and or Miami, and so that it's 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 different. I want to give a sense of the variety of things as well as and the differences as well as the common common places. You know, the other thing I'm sort of hoping is that people find it at all interesting is that they'll realize that, you know, you know, especially if they live in the South, you know, anywhere, but especially the South, whatever town you're in, whatever city you're in, something happened. And you could do it. You could write the history of um, the Black Arts Movement in Mobile or Savannah or um, wherever or Again, why don't we don't have a real history of the Black Arts Movement in Durham? You know, I, I get into it a little bit, but you know, it's it was vital. It was it was it was happening. All right, that's 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 my that's my beginning. Hopefully, it wasn't too dull. No, no, no. Um, so I'm you know I appreciate the opportunity to have this conversation with you, Jim. Um, you've been such a significant you know role. Uh, whether you knew it or knew it or not, uh, in terms of you know how I think about the articulations of culture in the region as an expression of regional identity, so thank you for that. Um, my, you know, I get to gush because I'm your conversation partner. So the very first time I read the Black Arts Movement, I was about to start graduate school at IU Bloomington, uh, and Valerie Grimm was was literally at her desk. She had her tea, <laughs> and she was like face deep in your book, and I'm like, what is that? And she was like, "Oh yeah, you need to read this before you come to IU." And it was, and it was the Black Arts Movement, and it completely, oh, yeah, it completely nice. blew my mind because I, I mean, you know, I I went to Albany State, which is you know a rural HBCU. Uh, my African American lit teacher was the first person I ever heard use the term Black Arts Movement, which kind of led me into this rabbit hole about. Who do I need to be listening to? So, you know, being able to read Larry Neal and getting into, you know, the elements of what is and what is not black art. Um, yeah, it jump started. It jump started a lot for me uh, to the point where, you know, my master's thesis was about uh, so it was about black masculinity in the South and the black arts movement. So I was kind of just shooting at the hip, so to speak. Uh, so I wish that this book was around back in 2007, 2008 when I was writing my thesis project. Um, so I, I appreciate, you know, appreciate that. But um, as soon as uh, Sonia asked me if I wanted to be the partner for this, I was like, well, duh, I've been waiting on this book for decades, it seems like. Um, me too. So, <laughs> right, so it's like you've been waiting on it, I've been waiting on it too. Um, so one of the things that that stood out when I was reading this, um, I think I sat with the introduction for a couple of days because there was just so much that I was, one, it was in parallel with my own research interests in terms of black popular culture and Southern identity. But also I was just like, you know, all of these things that I'm thinking in my head, you kind of validate it for me. Right. I was like, people talk about the black arts movement. They try to, usually it's from an urban perspective, like you said, but I'm like, I know that these kind of explosions of black consciousness and art were taking place uh, I'm in Georgia, so OTP, outside the perimeter, outside of Atlanta. And that, I know that that would look different than what it looked like in these different areas. So the title, your title of the book caught my attention the most, um, Behold the Land, right? Uh, and I always feel like Du Bois has such a unique relationship to the South, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, but, like before he had his, uh, I guess, his awakening, um, some folks will say it was the 1906 Atlanta race riot that really kind of changed his perspective about what that looks like in the South. But um, why did you just like, why did you decide to name the whole book Behold the Land? Because I have ideas in my head, but I mean, like, what was it about that particular quote in Du Bois that you were like, yep, this is going to set off the whole book? Well, you know, I, I besides it's a, this crucial link in Black radical history, 
is that I think that, you know, one of the things I try to argue in the book, which I didn't say before, but I mean, how long do you want to listen to me to go on? But that, um, you know, that it, it's not just a question. It's, it's, it's not like there are all these sort of hotshot, you know, black arts people, um, Amiri Baraka or, you know, uh, who felt actually, because his parents were from the South, uh, very connect and Newark is a very s southern kind of town, even though it's in New Jersey. I'm I'm a New Jerseyite. Uh, that, um, but you know, uh, you know, it's not like there are all these hotshots up north who who then or out west who then you know create all this this cool stuff and then and then sort of backward black people in the south, you know, get you know get the word and start doing things. Um, that it's like everything else in 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 African American culture because of the you know the way the U.S. history worked um, is that uh, and and you know frankly slavery which I talk about in the book you know I mean yeah there was slavery everywhere in the United States you know at least there was that there, there was the United States where I live in Deerfield Massachusetts I live uh, you know in the same town that Lucy Terry wrote the first poem, published poem by a black person, uh, Bar's Fight. So, I mean, we had it here for sure, but that, um, you know, obviously the South was ground zero of slavery here, you know, not just the 1619 thing, but also, you know, the slave economy. So it has a particular kind of resonance and meaning, not all of it good, but it is what it, you know, that's, that's part of it. But and so that you know, it's always been the epicenter of black culture. Mm -hmm. But what I was where I was really, you know, one of the where I, I'm going with this is that, um, that if though there were some very early black arts or proto black arts things going on in the south, like the Free Southern Theater, um, which was before most of the northern black theaters, like black, you know. Black Arts Repertory Theater in school in Harlem. It was before that, but um, that um, you know. So yeah, there may have been. So you know, certainly influence came down, but at the same time, um, you know, it was so crucial to the idea of a black nation. You know, I mean, if you didn't have the Black Arts Movement and Black Power in the South, then the whole idea of uh, black self-determination, the black nation, black nationhood, just couldn't work. Mm. Because, I mean, to my way of thinking, you know, pretty much every idea uh, about the black nation and black culture arising from the black nation that exists in the United States is rooted in some vision of black people and black culture in the South. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a reason why the Republic of New Africa who was found, which was founded by these guys from Detroit, Philadelphia and Detroit, basically, you know, decided that they wanted to start their independent society in the Mississippi Delta. They weren't up in, you know, the upper peninsula of Michigan. Mm -hmm. It's because, I mean, partly because black, you know, most black people, more black people, most black people in the United States lived and still live in the South. Oh, yeah. But uh, so that was that was true. But it, it was also uh, it had a meaning it had. And so what, what, what I think that the behold the land is this recognition of the centrality of the South to any sort of vision of black liberation in the black nation, a black nation, a black people. And so I put that there to, you know, think about how the black arts movement in the South, you know, carries on that sense of the centrality of the South um, and black people in the South and black culture in the South and black politics in the South. So that it's not a backward region, but it's a region on on the cutting edge, as it is today, you know, with Antar Chokwe Lumumba and, and Cooperation Jackson and so forth in Mississippi. And uh, the Birmingham, you know, uh, what's his name? Is it Woodhall, the the governor, the mayor of Birmingham? And there's a lot. Oh, you know, or or in North Carolina with uh, Reverend Barber and mm -hmm. the the, the uh, poor people's campaign, people poor people's campaign. You know, the new fusion 
politics and so forth. I mean, much more, frankly, much more exciting there than it is in my home state. <laughs> uh, you know, well, New Jersey, but also my current domicile of in Massachusetts. Uh, I mean, in, in the sense, that's one of the reasons why politics are so difficult in, in the South is because that in some ways, uh, black politics are, you know, so progressive. I mean, they're partly progressive because it's, it's the difficulty of the South, but also, you know, there's a reason why all this stuff is going on in Georgia, because that is, that is the challenge to the, uh, you know, you can envision a, a different kind of America in, in Georgia because of the way the politics have gone in recent years. And that's got people, some people, uh, very upset. That's putting it nicely. <laughs> I mean, you don't, you know, there was a lot of chaos in Michigan, a lot of chaos in Pennsylvania, but I don't think it has the same cultural meaning that, uh, uh, and debate and, and conflict, but doesn't have the same cultural meaning that Georgia has. Mm. So does that does that answer? I know it's a typical yeah. another long winded answer to your question. Because I'm I'm always just fascinated by how Du Bois fits into this larger narrative about Southern Black culture. Because you know he, he comes down to Atlanta University. You know what I'm saying? Before it becomes Clark Atlanta. You know. But I, I'm like it's just really interesting because at least for me because it's like when I when I because I was reading this and I also revisited the section in Souls of Black Folks where he goes to Southwest Georgia. And he has such a kind of like dry, almost condescending description of of the black folks who live there. And as a as a descendant of the black folks who live there, I was like, oh, okay. Um, so, but I mean, like, you know, I, I want to kind of stick with that I that distinction. You know what I'm saying between a Durham more so than an Atlanta or New Orleans. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about that? Like when you were looking at the more rural areas in the South, how this was manifesting, particularly Mississippi. Because Mississippi holds such a unique place, not only in Southern consciousness, but in national consciousness as well. They think that Mississippi is just supposed to be nothing but, you know, doom and gloom and woe is me, Black folks. But the reality of it is, you know, it is a cultural mecca in terms of Southern Black expression. You know what I'm saying? So, I'm yeah, wondering, yeah. you know, how, how did... How did you see that kind of manifesting in, when you were doing your research for this book in terms of how like you were establishing these distinctions between urban southernness and, and rural or small town southernness when it relates to the black arts movement? Well, you know, I mean, that was the original, I mean, with the Free Southern Theater, which starts at Tougaloo. I mean, well, one thing I have to say right up front, you know, and some of these campuses, mostly they're in cities, but some are not really. Mm -hmm. is one thing that, that distinguishes the South from everywhere else and gives it an enormous leg up in terms of creating the movement is the uh, HBCUs. Yep. I mean, there really aren't, you know, other than a couple in Pennsylvania and a couple in Ohio, there really aren't, you know, there, it's a Southern phenomenon mm -hmm. uh, or border state, you know, depending on what you think the South is. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and so, you know, you have, have schools with, you know, theater departments and art departments and so forth. I mean, that they they become places where hubs where this, even if the administration sometimes resist a bit, can do things. So, you know, uh, you had, uh, you know, one starting point, although some people will argue, I mean, some, including some of the people who were involved in it, um, pre-Southern theater at Tougaloo before it moves to, <clears throat> Yeah, uh, New Orleans, I mean, they're operating with a Southern, you know, to a Southern rural audience. I mean, and a lot of these people will travel around or to smaller towns, you know, I mean, the thing about the South is y y you can get into romantic ideas of, of the uh, of the South or, or sort of, in, um, especially for people who are outside the South. I mean, like you say, you're from Southwest Georgia. Yeah, there are a lot of black people in the countryside still um, compared to most places. But in the South, and by the 60s even, you know, most black people in the South were, were pretty urbanized. Mm. I mean, they may not have been in huge cities like Detroit mm. or Baltimore. Well, Baltimore is a kind of Southern town, but New York or Chicago. 
but they were in Albany. Albany is a pretty big town, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, uh, Macon, um, mm -hmm. again, pretty big, pretty big town and really important cultural centers, right? Macon, especially. Mm -hmm. uh, Augusta, which is, you know, James Brown's hometown, mm -hmm. Macon, Little Richard and Otis Red, you know, this stuff is so, you know, they're, they're, they're going, um, it's happening. I think the difficulty is, and, and, well, there are a couple of difficulties. One thing is we don't really know everything that's out there. That's mm. why, you know, if people find this book at all fun and you have any urges to be like, and I don't mean like a professional historian in the sense of working at a university or whatever, but just be a, write a local history. Right. Uh, you know, we, we don't know what is out there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but the people where you are do, some people do. I remember, and so I think that, you know, there is that there are these things out in the countryside or in the small towns. I remember when I was teaching at the University of North Florida in Jacksonville, and I had, um, that is Jacksonville, Florida, obviously, not North Carolina, uh, that, um, that you uh, had this student in my class, and, you know, an older student, which is to say, you know, my age. Uh, you know, non-traditional student, but uh, but so somebody who'd been in high school in the 70s, and uh, she um, came from Cross Creek, Georgia, I mean, Florida, which is still way out in the country in, in Florida. If you ever read The Yearling by Marjorie Rollins, it's all like swamps and deer, you know, falling in the swamp, and, you know, it's, 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 way out there and she talked about how she was in a theater group in Cross Creek in the really? 1970s black theater group and she and I was that was the moment where I just said man it was every place and who knows you know what what went on so you know I think that there's that I think by the nature of it you know still the centers of things tended to be cities maybe not just the big ones like Atlanta, but also Durham. Um, I mean, Raleigh's a pretty big city, but, um, you know, Chapel Hill, um, some of, you know, some of the, some of those places, but, you know, they, you know, the nature of it was that that's where you could have institutions, right? You had to have some place where there's enough people or enough support and, it often tended to be in black urban neighborhoods where there was some kind of synergy going on, like the Haiti neighborhood in Durham or um, the Jefferson Street neighborhood in Nashville or um, Third Ward in um, Houston, where there was some kind of synergy often between campus and community. Um, sometimes difficult synergy like in Atlanta where you know even to this day the relationship between the campuses of Atlanta mm -hmm. University Center and Vine City are not always mm -hmm. easy let's say but the black arts people I mean they were the ones who were trying to break that down so I I, I guess but yeah I mean I I think Okay, so long-winded kind of circular way, but what I will say is that what makes the South kind of interesting because it is a place where you have black, lots of black people, comparatively speaking, in, in rural areas, smaller towns, smaller cities, is that you have, even in the urban areas, people trying to build um, traveling groups, build institutions and so forth that reaches out to these, these people in a way that you don't really have so much in other regions. Maybe like El Teatro Campesino in California reaching out to rural farm worker audience, you know, Ch Chicano farm worker audiences. Uh, but you know, you wouldn't have groups in Chicago or Milwaukee or New York or Boston reaching out to like rural New England, say, in the same kind of way. I mean, probably the only other place that was like it, which is also the South, is Appalachia. And there yeah. you have an interesting dynamic between black and white. Mm -hmm. 
Does that um, does answer the question? I mean, yeah. I it's a complicated, you know, and I, I love complicated answers. <laughs> we have to, I don't usually say yes or no. Oh, no, I, I love it. I mean, I think that's a really good point. It's something that I, I feel like I'm, I don't know, I feel like I'm a parrot these days when I say it, Jim. I'm like, you know, the South is a complicated space and everything doesn't happen to everybody in the same way. Um, especially, you know, even within the same state, you know what I'm saying? Uh, what happens in Atlanta is different than what happens in Albany. It's different than what happens in Savannah or Waycross, you know? Um, and I think that's the one thing I really appreciated about, about your work in Behold the Land was this understanding that, you know, those com complexities impacted the type of artistic labor and artistic expression uh, that was that was coming out. Um, I also really appreciated the fact in your chapter on HBCUs, you didn't just focus on what folks call the Ivy Leagues of HBCUs, like the AUC and Howard. You know, so I was really, I really appreciated reading about Jackson State and Fisk. Um, it made me, it made me want to go to, you know, the archives at at my alma mater at Albany State and be like, what were y'all, you know, what were y'all doing, theater wise, artistic wise? Um, and I think uh, one of the things That'd be I was, fabulous if you did it. I mean, well, you know, it's also the flood. The flood of '94 happened, so a lot of the archives were destroyed. Um, but you know, I still, I still, I think that's something that I'm increasingly thinking about after reading your book is when we think about particular narratives and histories associated with the civil rights movement, we think about it kind of like in this one area. It's people in their Sunday's best, it's, it's Christian folks, and we're gonna try to overcome. What, what your book makes me think about is kind of like the artistic side of that. Um, how are folks using art and culture to engage these similar um, battles, so to speak, right? Um, so I know that, you know, when we think about the Black arts movement, like you said, we think about what Larry Neal says, it's the sister aesthetic of the Black power movement. And we don't necessarily think about the Black power movement in the South, but it, it existed, right? Uh, you gave, I think uh, you talked about the deacons of self-defense as an example. Um, so I was just curious. I mean, like, you know, what did you did you see any... Uh, alignment or even any tension between kind of like what the political motivations were for the civil rights movement compared to the the artistic movements that were happening uh, around the same time? Well, definitely. Um, well, there are numbers of things. I mean, they're political. I mean, and, and also between, well, I mean, when you talk about civil rights and black power, uh, I mean, they're sort of, they can be sort of one and the same. I mean, they will, people who are involved will make a distinction, but, you know, obviously um, one of the key, the key groups uh, in terms of the transformation of black power, civil rights to black power in the South were civil rights groups. I mean, SNCC mm -hmm. or especially um, some other ones, you know, Deacons for Defense and so forth. Um, and, but, um, you know, so there are po political, um, there are some political things. I mean, one of the things that's interesting about the South, though, as far as politics go, and the way it's been explained to me at times, although the different areas had their own peculiar, uh, you know, po political uh, complexions, I guess you could say, um, you know, for, for some reason, I mean, I try to think about it, but it's interesting in like the Upper South, Tennessee, North Carolina, Washington, which I consider to be part of the South, um, and Atlanta, which I don't know if you consider that the Upper South, but I think because of the HBCUs, you mm -hmm. often get these weird, well, not weird, but you know, to some people they might seem weird, un unlikely mixtures of Marxism and cultural nationalism, mm -hmm. which you wouldn't expect. You know, people are into Mao and Milana Karenga at the same time. It's not the red book versus the green book. It's the red book and the green book mm -hmm. and a whole bunch of other stuff too. Uh, New Orleans for whatever reason and, and, and Texas and so forth. And that what I call sometimes uh, the S Southern Black Cultural Alliance uh, archipelago that goes from like Miami to, uh, to Texas. Um, not so much, not Marxism, not so much. Um, there, that's not as much in the mix and it's more cultural nationalist. Um, so there's, there's, and that's obviously pretty different than, than civil rights. But I will, where I was going to say is one of the things that's interesting about the South is you don't, for the most part, see the bitter feuds that you see other regions between Marxists mm -hmm. and cultural nationalists. They don't have the same 
falling out. I mean, I obviously that it, it's reflected in the South too. For one thing, there are national organizations that go out of existence because, partly because of infighting, and you know they have members. In the Congress of African People has members in the South. The African Liberation Support Committee has a lot of members in the South. Uh, so that that does. Um, I don't think there, but you know, and, and as far as the artists go, I don't think there's much conflict. It's not, again, like you get in California, where you have fallings out between, say, the Black Panthers and a lot of the artists who are more cultural and nationalists. You don't really see that in the South so much. I do think that what you will see, and I, you know, it's, I, it's, like with the Free Southern Theater, I mean, one of the reasons why they moved from Tougaloo to New Orleans is um, they want to get away from the front lines of the civil rights movement a little bit because it's pretty hard to function as an arts group if you're under the constant demands of the movement on the front lines, you know, because. You know, one of the things that, you know, I tried to take seriously in, in, in this book and everything I do is to think about artists as, you know, basically as workers, which is to say that, you know, and, and, and think about art as a material process, and which is to say it takes time, it takes training, it takes energy, it takes effort, it takes money, all that stuff. And... Uh, if you're spending all your time writing newspaper articles or leaflets or what have you, it's hard to put on plays mm -hmm. or develop your craft. Um, it's a constant battle that they went through. In a way, that's where the HBCUs, I mean, yeah, as we know, you know, both of us who have to do it, you know, you're always robbing Peter to pay Paul between your teaching and your writing and um, other things that you do. But, you know, ne nevertheless, they can be spaces where you can do a number of different things because um, you're kind of paid to do it. Um, and uh, that that's those are important spaces. But uh, so I don't know. I mean, I guess what I, I'd say is I don't see you don't see the same sorts of political struggles between factions and between, um, you know, artists and activists and or tensions that you see, I, I don't, I didn't find it, and people told me this, uh, as you see elsewhere, um, so not to the same extent, which is one reason why black arts last longer in the South than it does other places. Mm. I mean, this book, I, you know, I go into the eighties. I mean. In some places, you know, I mean, I guess you could say it's over, but, you know, I'm not sure it ever ended, mm -hmm. actually. You know, I mean, Atlanta is a good example. I mean, you know, right. you know, what is Hammond's house? You know, the gallery in Atlanta. Or what is the National Black Theater Festival? Is It's in, what, Wake Forest, I think? Uh, you know, uh, in North Carolina, you know, uh, so I, I think, and the, and the explanation I had for that from a lot of people is that, um, you know, the South was so politically difficult. <laughs> you know, the people who you were facing, your, your opponents were so, it was, a, it was a difficult environment. I mean, there was no question. I mean, it was good in some ways. There are a lot of black people in the South. They have a lot of traditions of struggle. There's a lot of cultural strength in the South, a lot of sense of community uh, in the South in certain kinds of ways, but that at the same time, you you know, I mean, Lester Maddox was the governor of Georgia from, he got elected, you know, to, to the governorship of Georgia because he handed out ax handles to his, his, uh, and baseball bats to his customers to, so that, Black sinners would not go into the chick his chicken restaurant. Mm -hmm. He was the governor. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, we're kind of back in those days again, but I mean, they were, you know, I have family in Mississippi. I mean, Ross Barnett, I remember my aunt saying, yeah, you know, well, she was a little liberal by Mississippi standards, saying he was a disgrace. But, you know, he was, they were extreme, really extreme. I mean, I had a cousin with a cross burned on his front lawn for suggesting that possibly black people. He was at the University of Alabama, should go to the University of Alabama, be able to go to the University of Alabama. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, it was so in that, I'm, and I'm not trying to talk about my heroic family because you know, I'm, you know, by the standards of the people we're talking about, you know, they're the heroes, mm -hmm. Jim Alexander or Doris Derby or um, Free Southern or you know, Mal people at Malcolm S University, and I mean, those were those are heroic folk, mm -hmm. but um, that. Um, Consequently, because there was you were facing such difficult a difficult situation in a lot of ways that required a lot of unity to face it, people felt that they had less time for those sorts of factional things mm. than they did in say New York in or other other places. Um, you know, and I I believe it. You know, I don't. You know. Someone else might tell you something different. I don't know. I'm not saying it didn't happen. <laughs> I think the difference in the South, actually, the differences really were between those zones like North Carolina, Nashville, Atlanta, where it tended to be people from the campuses reaching into the communities, mm -hmm. mostly HBCUs, although in the case of uh, Durham, you also had the students, black students at Duke. To, um, as opposed to places like New Orleans and Houston, where you know there were HBCUs that were important, but they were really more community-based from the start. Mm -hmm. And in a way, it was almost more like reaching in from the community into the campuses. No, I believe that. I feel that. No, I think that's that's a really great way of, of putting it. Um, and it also makes me think about too, and and you know, this is kind of how I teach it to my students in my survey of African American lit class. We have a whole mini unit on the Black Arts Movement. I'm like, a lot of those uh, touchstones that folks think about with literacy in terms of you know you have to have a certain amount of education to really appreciate and understand the movement, the struggle. You know, Black art, uh, Black arts advocates were using the arts to inform the community, and community was informing the arts, right? Um, right. So I think that that's a really a really good thing. Uh, I have one more question for you before uh, we can open it up for for questions from the audience. So to sure. the audience members, you know, if you want to put in questions, comments, snide remarks into the comment box or the chat box, please do. <laughs> um, Unless I, my brothers in the audience know some snide remarks. <laughs> <laughs> unless your unless your Jim's brother no snide remarks. Um, my last question is 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 the woman question. I always ask this question because I find this really fascinating that. Um, so, so many women, I mean, I'm not surprised by it, but I mean, like so many women were so adamantly and, and passionately involved in the black arts movement in the South. I was like, yes. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm curious to hear your, your thoughts about, did you see any distinctions, um, not necessarily just regionally, but I mean, like in your work on the black arts movement, what, what role did you see black women playing and how, oh. how it belong and everything? A crucial, and you know, again, it kind of depends on where you're at, and you know, um, without getting into a whole thing, I mean, well, maybe I will get into a little bit of a thing. I mean, the places where, um, you know, uh, Milana Karanga and Kawaita's ism had, um, you know, that's for those of you, he's the guy who invented Kwanzaa. You know, if you, you're familiar with Kwanzaa, you can look it up. The seven principles that are associated with Kwanzaa are like in this whole Kau Kauaitis thing, that was a pretty, I mean, I don't know what you want to call it, masculinist, let's just say, um, the idea that women are not equal to men, they're complementary to men. I don't mean like, you know, you look marvelous kind of compliments. I mean, I mean that they're kind of like an add-on or they're there to support the men. I mean, it's it's pretty patriarchal. It was, I mean, he, he moves off of that in the 70s, uh, Karanga. So in those places, um, I think it was a little harder, although as the historian Ashley Farmer has pointed out about people like Amina Baraka in Newark or some of the uh, activists, cultural nationalist activists in Karenga's organization, us in Los Angeles, women, black women found a way to, mm -hmm. to, to make themselves heard even in those places. But... Um, but at the same time, you know, um, one of the things that's absolutely fascinating to me about black arts in the South, especially in Georgia, especially in Atlanta, and then, you know, because of Atlanta's influence, other places, is the degree to which um, uh, 
black feminism, black nationalism, black Marxism, other kinds of, of you know, radicalism, uh, merge together without any real uh, conflict. Mm. So that, and, uh, and Atlanta was a real hotbed for this. In part, you know, one of the things that makes Atlanta a special place, I mean, there are a number of issues, I mean, a number of factors that make Atlanta kind of a special place. But the uh, one thing that makes it really special is the presence of Spelman College. Mm -hmm. You know, is now it is true that it's sort of like, you know, I don't know if you want to say the black ivy kind of thing. I mean, I think, you know, in some ways people have a way of, say, looking at that, um, at Spelman as being sort of higher on the food chain than, say, Bennett College in North Carolina, which itself was a very important institution. Mm -hmm. but, I mean, the thing about Spelman, though, that made it, uh, you know, really important is that it, it, because it's a women's college, black women's college, it hired black women artists right. as right. artists in residence who then would be in um, Atlanta. I mean, some of the people were sort of local, but a lot of people came from the outside and came to Atlanta and then had an, and uh, in the black arts period, you know, the more black arts oriented ones would get out into the neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that, uh, that was really important. That didn't happen everywhere. Cause you know, there were a lot of schools uh, black, you know, HBCUs like the predominantly white institutions that were not women's colleges that basically didn't hire women. Right. I, mean, I went to college after the black arts era, but close enough that I was an English major. There were 25 faculty members. It's true. It was kind of a backwater university, but that, um, you know, 25 faculty members in the English department, 24 of whom were women. I mean, men, one woman mm -hmm. who'd only been there for two years. So, you know, I mean, the HBCUs, a lot of them were kind of like that also, right? I mean, there weren't a lot of women on the faculty. So Spellman being there meant that there was, you know, this, uh, these, these really first rate artists, you know, I mean, by first rate, I mean, people who were, you know, had had a chance to develop their craft. I mean, most importantly, probably was Tony K. Bambara. Yeah. Yep. And she was crucial, you know, and, and I have to say Atlanta was crucial to her development. You know, uh, you can see when you read uh, Gorilla My Love, her collection of short stories, or you read uh, The Salt Eaters, her great novel, how important Georgia was to her development and her consciousness. Mm -hmm. However, um, and she would say that she saw no contradiction between being a feminist being a nationalist and you know i mean i don't know if she said i'm a marxist but pretty pretty leftish na leftish nationalist she had no she found that there was no contradiction to it and unlike in other places there was no uh no uh you know no one not much pushback i mean there may have been some you know knucklehead you know hardhead somewhere who who did, but I mean, basically she was accepted, partly because she paid her dues, right? I mean, she was in the movement, she was there. Another person who was sort of a protege to some degree of uh, um, Tony Cade was uh, Pearl, and who's still there, Pearl oh, Clegg. Clegg. Yeah, mm -hmm. and Clegg is, and Pearl Clegg is another person who, say, you know, sees, would say, or Alice Lovelace, the poet, they say, would say, they see no, um, no problem with being a feminist and being a nationalist. Uh, and mm -hmm. they would go to the Cherish bookstore and participate there, which was a kind of, I, I, I don't know if you call it a mainstream feminist bookstore, because I'm not sure there was such a thing, especially in the South at that time, but it wasn't a black feminist bookstore. It was a feminist bookstore and they were there from the very beginning. So I, I think, you know, not only are women playing a particular role, but, you know, Atlanta really is a place where there is, you know, it's sort of a uh, incubator of, of, of black, black feminism, hmm. uh, both in terms of the arts as well as in terms of politics in a way that, you know, you don't really see, you know, it's, it's much more, um, someone like Entezaki Shange elsewhere, you know, New York or on the West Coast gets much more pushback than Tony Cade does. 
Um, and I think it's it's a different environment. So I, I think it's it's really crucial. Now, having said that, I don't know that it's, you know, that sort of feeling is true every place, but it's certainly the South is one place where it does happen. And I, I think it's a fascinating, I mean, I think, you know, there's a book, you know, some people I've written a little bit about that in, you know, and it's, some of it's in here and, you know, uh, Kimberly Springer's book, you know, talks a little bit about uh, Atlanta, but you know, there's a whole, unless someone's written and I just haven't seen it, there's a whole book to be written about uh, the Black South, especially Black Atlanta, and uh, the rise of Black feminism in the United States. I don't know. Maybe it's one of these these future scholars. I hear it. That is not my. <laughs> well, well, you know, obviously, I mean, I don't know about it, obviously, but I don't think I'm writing it either. I've got more stuff to do than I I'm gonna <laughs> probably live to do. So. Um, so, but yeah, I just, you know, and, and Anthony Boynton is, is in the chat and he made a really great point. You know, uh, Beverly Guy Sheftall is such a huge uh, reason for a lot of these scholars and, and artists and residents to be able to come to Spelman right. and, and do this amazing work. So, you know, as always, giving flowers when they're due. So Dr. Sheftall is, is wonderful. And uh, what's her name, Barbara Mol in Molet? I mean, and also because, of, you know, in terms of both reaching out, they, you know, Tony Cade, I mean, the good thing about Tony Cade or one or the great one of the things about Tony Cade Bambara is when she got there, she landed at Spelman. And I think a lot of people emulated her. Uh, and 15 minutes later, she was looking for a place to to be involved with the community. Mm -hmm. So she didn't just stay at the university yeah. center, but she went out and she got involved with the uh, which was a, an amazing thing, which, you know, had to do with Maynard, you know, really took off with Maynard Jackson and his administration, which is the Neighborhood Arts Center. Yeah, the OCA, and the OCA, the Office of Cultural Affairs. and Yeah, I mean, and amazing people, and you know, and then they, they would uh, they would hook up with the folks, the men over at Morehouse, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. artistically, I mean, uh, that they, uh, you know, they, um, and so you, you know, that's, you have, uh, you know, Samuel L. Jack Jackson and, let Tanya, you know, get Jackson, Richard, you know, they, that's, I mean, they, you know, they're, they're in a sense, their relationship, you could say, or their partnership is, um, you know, almost an embodiment of the sort of Morehouse Spellman arts connection. Mm. So that they're, you know, it's so it's not because a lot of those programs like the, the, the theater, the theater programs were joint. Right. Productions, right. so you know it was it was important, but you know then then people reaching out both to the other schools and into the communities to to, I mean, the next time you look at a you know Spike Lee movie, that's part of it. <laughs> it's true though. That's true. Um, Jim, thank you so much for for having this conversation with me, folks. Y'all need to go get this book. Behold the mm -hmm. letter. <laughs> Y'all need to get this book. Um, it, it's 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 definitely uh, reclaiming some space that I had questions about as a sub as a southerner as a southern black creative. Um, I'm very appreciative of the the effort that you put because it's definitely there. You did some you did some heavy hauling in terms of archival research and right right. Well, and, thank you, so, thank you. Yeah, so you know, thank you so much for for your for your labor. Oh, well, thank and, you uh, and all of and I, and I, I really appreciate your efforts too because thank you. thank you very um, much. You know, it really helped me put, you know, the legacy of that moment into some kind of perspective. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, and it gives me stuff to work on with the second book, especially this, the conversation about black women in this book is really helping me think about where folks like Zora Neale Hurston fit into this larger narrative about, you know, that kind of pre, pre black arts and why that was, you know, continuing. So thank right, you. Right. Again, Jim. This, thank you, you. this work is going to, it's definitely going to open some doors and ask, have folks ask some questions. Thank you both so much. It's clear from the conversation that I've been listening to that um, you both are just so knowledgeable about your work and these communities um, across the whole South. I just, it's like the name dropping that y'all are doing is inspirational. You have such good memories. I feel like I could never keep all that information in my head. Um, but it's all an act. I'm old, like I said. <laughs> 
Don't ask me my uh, phone number. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's, I mean, when you write it a million times, that helps. Yes. Um, okay, so we are going to go ahead and wrap up. I'm not seeing any audience questions, um, but that's okay. It looks like we're about at time anyway. Um, thank you both so much for your time tonight and for having such a, a passionate and fun conversation. Uh, I learned a lot and I look forward to reading both of your books. Um, as should everybody watching, uh, if you are interested in buying a copy of Chronicling Stanconia or Behold the Land or e any other books from these authors, you can click the green link below our faces and purchase those from Flyleaf. Uh, we really appreciate the support. <laughs> they do. Exactly. <laughs> you know, Father's Day uh, uh, right around the corner, I believe. Information, uh, bar mitzvah, bar mitzvahs, uh, birthdays, yeah. Christmas. Hanukkah. Sure, absolutely. Know, uh, I love it. You know, Kwanzaa. <laughs> you, All right. You, you know, <laughs> okay. Well, totally. thank you. I hope I get to actually come to Flyleaf in person some point. Now that yeah, we may be coming out of lockdown. Fingers mm -hmm. crossed. We are just Fingers starting crossed. to uh, figure out what hybrid and in-person events are going to look like uh, for the fall. So we may be able to get something in the works for your next project. Um, yeah, absolutely. So thank you both so much. Okay, and thank, thank you, you to everyone watching. Have a good night. Yeah, bye-bye. So bye.